highly favored. Sometimes we take that for granted, those words, blessed and highly favored. And we don't realize it. It becomes just sayings many times, the things that we say about the Lord. And we say them, we say we believe them, but the fruit of belief isn't there. It isn't shown when we are shaken by circumstances, emotions. And it's important to realize that we have to keep our emotions in check if we're going to develop into maturity. We can't be immature emotionally and be mature spiritually. Our feelings and our emotions have to be led by us. Our life cannot be led by feelings and emotions and wind up in a good place. They will take us to a place of destruction. It's like putting the caravan, the cart, the wagon in front of the horses and then running it. There'll be disaster. But decisions and choices that are made according to the word of God needs to be the engine that pilots our life and drives our life. And emotions need to be put in the caboose and they'll come in line and they'll follow in a good path. And then torment, then frustration, then aggravation, then anxiety, then depression. We'll all jump in the caboose. They will get on tr the track that God has put us on and we will experience joy, unspeakable joy, peace that surpasses all understanding, the shalom, the wholeness of God. And unless God is put first, and that's a choice, all else will fall apart. Amen? Well, I thank God. I thank you for, I thank the worship team, the praise and worship. Um, and I, I, I say both those words because there was a time of praise, but there definitely was also a time of worship. And sometimes we use those words together um, as if they're the same thing. But there is a huge difference between praise and worship. Um, and so uh, I have a word and I need to be careful to try to stick to this word so that I can bring the whole word in. And uh, a lot of times I'll, I'll, I'll go. Um, and unless I have a strong uh, uh, inclination and inspiration to just step off and move from, from these words, um, I, I'm going to stick to it. And what we're going to talk about today is something that is absolutely essential in the life of a Christian, in the life of a person, in the life of anyone who has been created, that has been birthed into the earth, and that has life, that that life was birthed into the earth for the purpose that God would have you as family. He has come. He has already done it. He has already uh, uh, went to the cross. He has already shed his blood. He's already has worn the stripes and the wounds. And by his stripes, we've already been healed. That's 2,000 years ago. That's already there. And if you have a prayer, you don't really have to plead and beg God because he wants to do it more than you and I want it done. He is the one who has troubled himself to come. He is the one who's troubled himself to take and make the plan of salvation. He's the one who troubled himself from since Adam and Eve in the garden all the way up till now, this generation, to take and to script for us how he is and who he is and how we are and who we are. So God wants us to know him. He's not hiding himself from us. He has given us 
absolute access to him and access to everything that's in the inheritance of those who are the children of God. And Christ has already laid down his life. He's already died for us. So the inheritance is already ours. He has already risen from the grave. He's already ascended into heaven. He's sitting at the right hand of the throne of God. And he is there at God's throne at the right hand of the father. And he is interceding for you and for me and those are effective fervent prayers that Christ has for us but not only that he has sent us the paraclete the helper the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit is there he is inside of us and with moans and groans and things that we can't understand that we can't discern that we can't discern that God alone can discern he has a language that he has a perfect prayer that is in line with the with Jesus Christ that it the two are together in prayer in agreement with the will of the Father. That's three in agreement for you and for me. And so inside of you, there is a spirit that is praying for you and understand that God is not flesh, that he's a spirit. And those who worship him will worship him in spirit and in truth. And so he's given us a spirit that worships him. He's given us a spirit that prays a perfect will for him. And so he is there. Do you think that he doesn't want to heal you no he wants to heal you but will you believe it will you trust it will you receive it do you think that there is a mental or a psychological problem that he can't heal there is nothing that is impossible for God he can do it he can do it all and not only can he do it he wants to do it he's the one who stepped out of heaven he's the one who wrapped himself in flesh he's the one who's went through it all for you and for I perfect sinless God himself on the cross taking your place in my place to die for us and to suffer and to be forsaken so you and I are never forsaken we're never alone you might feel lonely but God is right there with you I want to talk about the habitation of God, the dwelling place of God, habitation and, and a place where you dwell, your environment, your atmosphere are absolutely important. You can't survive in any environment. You can't thrive in any environment. A shark thrives and it survives in the water, in the ocean. You and I need to land. And so we have a certain environment, a certain atmosphere. There's an atmosphere of God. There's an environment of God. There's a culture of God. And there's a place that is home for God. And his will, he says, let it be on earth as it is in heaven. That's how he led us to pray. And so he wants you to experience heaven now on earth. That's his will. So if you're experiencing something else, it's not God doing that. No, he's offered us something else, and we have to make a choice. We choose. We choose life or death or blessing or curse. We choose. And so today the Lord wants to take and he wants to speak to you, and he wants to lay before you a choice that you make. And when you make a choice, you commit to the choice that you make, and you walk in it and watch. Watch the doors open. Watch the sea move. Watch him split the Red Sea that you can walk through on dry land. Watch him move mountains for you. Watch what he can do. You take and you look. Yeah, you might have fears, you might have struggles, and you might have challenges. It'll challenge your faith in order to produce strong faith in you. The habitation of God. If we go to the book of Genesis, the book of beginnings, and we look at chapter 8. There's a story. This is the Old Testament. It's, it's a well-known story. It's the story of Noah in Genesis chapter 8. Verse 7. It says, 
and sent out a raven. And it kept flying back and forth until the water had dried up from the earth. Then he sent out a dove to see if the water had receded from the surface of the ground. But the dove could find no place to set its feet because there was water all over the surface of the earth. So it returned to Noah in the ark. He reached out his hand and took the dove and brought it back to himself in the ark. He waited seven more days and again sent out the dove from the ark. When the dove returned to him in the evening, there in its beak was a freshly plucked olive leaf. Then Noah knew that the water had receded from the earth. We stand up for a moment, just in reverence. We're going to pray. Heavenly Father, we bless your holy name and we thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you for your presence in this place. God, we thank you for opening up the heavens and pouring out your spirit upon all flesh. Thank you, Lord, that today, because of Christ, the Spirit of God indwells those who believe. We ask you, Lord, to help us, God, that we will be aware of failing to recognize the true nature of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, we're sorry for all that we've done, and we repent. We ask your forgiveness. We need you. We thank you so much for this ground here. Oh, God, this is holy ground. I don't take it for granted. Lord, you've sanctified this place and set it apart. I ask you to breathe once again the fresh breath of God on your word, Lord. And your word, oh, God, is like a hammer. And I pray, God, that your word comes. And like a hammer, God, that it shatters our preconceived ideas, Lord. And it breaks our traditions. And Lord, that you give us true insight and revelation into the ways of God. Now we thank you for it. And we bless you. And all the people of God said, Amen. You can be seated. And so here we have uh, this story, this well-known story of Noah. And it says that after the rains had stopped, that Noah had to determine whether it was safe to open the ark and to get out. And so it says that he released a raven. And the raven simply flew around and it settled here, there, and everywhere. You see, the raven is an unclean bird. It's a dirty bird. And it's at home in any kind of environment. It doesn't matter the environment, doesn't matter the atmosphere. The raven is at home in it. He's at home with an unclean carcass or a bloated carcass floating down the water. It doesn't matter. And Noah could not determine whether the waters had settled. And so we see in verse 8, he releases a dove. And after flying around, she came back to him. And he waited seven days. You see, she was flying and she couldn't settle because there was no resting place for her feet. 
Now, the dove couldn't settle where the raven settled. The dove is a clean bird. And it'll have nothing to do with debris. It'll have nothing to do with filth or carnage. Obviously, the dove is the symbol of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit could not settle because of uncleanliness. And so he waited seven more days and released the dove again. And the dove returned with a fresh picked olive leaf in her beak. It was fresh. It was vigorous. It was, it was not altered. It was not processed. It was free from taint. It was pure. It was strong. A fresh picked olive leaf in a beak and no one knew the waters had abated. They receded. The dove settled where there was life, not where there was death. Not where there was disease or corruption, but where there was something that was new and fresh and vibrant and See, all scripture is given by inspiration of God, and we can gain something. We can learn something from it. It says we can profit from scripture. Paul said to Tim Timothy to watch your life and your doctrine carefully. We can learn something here about the nature of the Holy Spirit. And all of these symbols here are very meaningful for us. Again, the Holy Spirit is like a dove, and a dove that is very sensitive, that will not settle where there is uncleanliness. Why? Well, I'm glad you asked. Because he is holy. He is the Holy Spirit. It's against his nature to settle in a place contrary to his nature. And so we need to ask ourselves a question now that we are enlightened about the nature of the Holy Spirit. Why is it that the Holy Spirit can't settle in my life? What is it that is repulsive to the Spirit of God. What is it that is going on that the Spirit of God says, listen, I can't participate in that. I can't participate in what you're doing. I can't participate in what you're saying. I can't participate in the music that you are listening to. I can't participate in what you're watching on TV. I can't participate in the sites you go in on the computer. I can't participate in the places that you dwell. I can't participate with those things that you do in your life. And if the two of us are going to get along We've got to be in agreement. Now, two of us can't walk together unless we agree. And I'm not in agreement with what you're doing. I'm not in agreement with your lifestyle. I'm not in agreement with the music. I'm not in agreement with the things that you watch on TV. I'm not in agreement with the things, the way that you're always thinking. I'm talking to you, telling you to think on these things. You see, we don't just take God and put him on the throne on Sunday morning and say, now listen, God, you listen here. Now, you sit in that place because for the next couple of hours, Lord, 
have your rightful place. And we'll get up and we'll stand up and we'll sing about it. Didn't we sing? Didn't we sing about it? And don't we sing? He is Lord. He is Lord. But then we go out. Now you come in and you should never leave the same. And there is a such thing as bad fellowship. Many times we look at bad leadership, but God is a perfect leader. And we go out, and of course, okay, service is over. You're no longer Lord. He's no longer Lord now. Let's go to Revelations chapter 4. We want to talk about this thing. The inhabitation, the dwelling place. Of God, the place where he lives. Revelations chapter 4, verse 9. It says, Whenever the living creatures give glory, honor, and thanks to him who sits on the throne and who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne, and worship him who lives forever and ever. They lay their crowns before the throne and say, You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. So whenever the living creatures give glory, honor, and thanks to him who sits on the throne and who lives forever, the living creatures give glory, honor, and thanks to him who sits on the throne. Now, three things that are there. And we're not going to go into a long study on this, but three things. The first thing is they give glory to him who sits on the throne. The Bible says, whatever you do in word or deed, do all to the glory of God. Whatever you do, not just in the house of God, and we tend to separate the spiritual from the natural many times. And again, we are epistles written and read of all men wherever you are. Again, God, is what I am doing glorifying you? Holy Spirit, is what I'm doing and the way I'm living, is what I'm thinking of, is it glorifying you? Am I glorifying you on the job? Am I glorifying you, brothers, in the dorm in the morning when I wake up? Am I glorifying you by honoring those that God appointed over you to set a certain structure that you should live by and adjust your life to, to get it together because he is saving you and in the process of transforming you so that you won't be in the place that you were in? Is what I'm doing glorifying you in the way that I'm talking and what I'm thinking of? is what I'm doing glorifying you and how I address somebody in my grumpiness in the morning. Maybe that's my bad time or on the job, maybe because things seem to frustrate me and not go my way. Am I glorifying you? Is what I'm doing glorifying you? I have to check myself because all the living creatures, as it is in heaven, let it be that way on earth, they give thanks, they give glory, they give honor. Is what I'm doing, is it glorifying you, God? Yes. Yes. 
is what I'm watching on TV glorifying you. We need to ask ourselves these questions. Again, we are looking for the abiding presence of God. And many times we get excited about an experience with God. But God is looking to give us more than an experience. He has come to dwell in us. Know ye not that you are the vessels of the Holy Ghost is of God, which is in you. You were bought with a price. You're not your own. It's ownership. I belong to you. I'm your property. I've been bought. And number two, then they honor him and give thanks to him. And see, God is a God who enjoys thanksgiving. See, we find this consistently throughout the word of God. Enter his gates with thanks. See, Psalm 104. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and come into his courts with praise. It sound familiar? See, you see, there's something about Thanksgiving. You know, God said to the nation of Israel, I want you to begin to be thankful. Because, is another thing, see? He says, because you did not serve the Lord your God with gratitude and or with thankfulness for all that God gave you, the abundance of things he gave you, If you don't serve him with gratitude and thankfulness, he said, I'll turn you over and you will serve your enemies. That's a tough penalty. Not because you went into adultery. Not because you committed fornication. Not because you bowed down to some idol. Not because you burned incense to Baal or someone else or something else. No. Because you lost that thanksgiving. Good parents, okay, good parents, like God, teach their children to say thank you. One of the first things you do with your kids, even before the ABCs, is you say, what do you say, Johnny? We want children that are thankful. And nothing worse than being around someone that's always ungrateful. That's always murmuring and complaining and always seeing the negative of things. There's nothing more wonderful, though, than being around someone that's positive, I mean, in a genuine sense. Always thanking God, always grateful. In everything, the Bible says what? To give Romans 1.21 says, although they knew God, they what? They honored him not as God. Neither were they thankful. You see, it began with a lack of thanksgiving. Thanksgiving is so important. You ought to make a list. You ought to check it twice. And you ought to make that list of things that you are grateful for. You're on this side of the soil. You can see. You can hear. You can walk. You still can talk. He's gave you the breath of life. What you reach in your pantry and grab in the morning for a meal, it was created and provided by him. The very ground that you walk on, the roads that you drive on, the electricity that you have, None would be impossible without him. Although they knew him, they honored him not as God, neither were they thankful. Therefore, God gave them over 
to a reprobate mind. Reprobate mind. See, we read that sometime, and we don't understand what a reprobate mind is. A reprobate mind is a person who's ordained for damnation, for condemnation. It's a scoundrel. That's what God, that's what his word says. Reprobate mind. He gave them over. He, he gave them over. You choose life or death, blessing or curse. He said, I give you a choice. They chose. And so he said, okay. Sometimes it's tough to get what you choose. You see, it began with that lack of thanksgiving. It's absolutely essential that we be a people of thanksgiving. God does what? He inhabits what? Praise basically is thanksgiving. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Thank you, Lord, for providing for me. Thank you, Lord, for healing me. Thank you for all of these benefits that are new every morning. It's thanksgiving. Heaven is full of thanksgiving. In Exodus 25, God said, Moses, when you make this temple, it's got to be an exact copy of what I'm used to in heaven. He said, it's not about you. You're making this temple. Needs to be an exact copy of what I'm used to in heaven. I want to be at home in this temple. He said, make it an exact copy of what I'm used to in heaven. I, I come into my house with thanksgiving. You come in with thanksgiving. Uh, don't come in with murmuring. Don't come in with criticizing. Don't come in with complaining. Come in with thanksgiving. Why? Because this is what it's going to be like in heaven. That's what's going on in heaven. God parted the heavens for Moses, and he said, I want my will done on earth as it is in heaven. I want to feel at home on earth as I do in heaven. I want to feel at home inside of you as I do in heaven. You know, the psalmist wrote, he said, let us come before his presence with thanksgiving in our heart. You see, in Revelation chapter 4, we see the 24 elders and they fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. And they lay their crowns before the throne and they say, you are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things. And by your will, they were created and have their beings. Listen. Now, we find that heaven is a place where there is worship going on. It's worship there. And I think that Revelations is the New Testament Psalms. And not every, every worship leader, every, every, every psalmist, every song leader should study the book of Revelations. All of the songs a glorifying God. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Magnify him. Exalt him. But so often it's all about me. It's all about what I did. But worship, we must study the book of Revelation. It talks about the power of God. It talks about the greatness of God. You are worthy, Lord, because you were slain and went to redeem for yourself a people and so on. What is worship? We use the words praise and worship interchangeably, and they are both one and the same, at least that's how we use them many times, but we sort of, we sort of get lazy a little bit when it comes to defining things, and, and I think that there's a vast difference. As I said in the beginning, uh, a, a great friend, a teacher, 
he told me that prayer is preoccupation with our needs. That praise is a preoccupation with our blessings. And that worship is preoccupation with God himself. Most of our prayers is asking God for something. Lord, heal me. Lord, bless me. Lord, protect me. Lord, heal my children. Lord, bless my mother. Lord, give favor to my brother. Lord, anoint me. Lord, produce for me. Lord, do this. Lord, do that. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with laying your request before him, with casting your cares upon him. He says to do that. There's nothing wrong with that at all. But again, thanksgiving. Worship is this. It's about his worth. Regardless of whether the bills are paid, regardless of what's going on around me, regardless of my emotions or my feelings, regardless of what you said to me, regardless of how you treated me, regardless of uh, what anyone does to me, regardless of the circumstances or the situation. It does not change. I'm a worshiper. It may surprise you to know that the greatest acts of worship in the Bible we're, we're never associated with music. Isn't that revelation? The first time it is mentioned in the Bible, worship. There's an old, there's an old law, okay, that I looked at many times, and uh, uh, that many of the old expositors use that. And it's called the law of first mention. And it means when you come across something for the very first time in the Bible, it establishes a precedence. It gives you an understanding. It gives you a revelation of how that phrase or word is used throughout the rest of the word of God. For example, in Genesis, it said, God saw that man was flesh. Now, obviously, man is flesh. God created him that way, but not this sort. He wasn't talking about that. There's a different word for flesh in the Bible, and, and this sort of flesh and the flesh, the flesh that is wrong. This one, and there's flesh that's wrong. Literally, it meant going astray. He's flesh. And there we have the definition of flesh. It's the tendency in us to do our own thing. That which is wholly carnal and sensual, man's carnal nature, given up to fleshly appetites and passions with all its qualities and appetites, weaknesses and corruption by sin. There's a sinful flesh, but this is not it. It means, it, 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 it's, it, it, it's in our, yes, it's in us, it's in our person, but it's not our body. If it was, then all we have to do is go on a diet if we want to be holy. The more you lose, the holier you get. But it's the tendency, it's that nature within us to do our own thing. And the very t first time that worship is mentioned in the Bible, in Genesis chapter 22, verse 1 and 2, God said, Abraham, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom thou lovest. Here was a man who God had tested so many times, Abraham. The first test, he said, leave your people, leave your father's house, leave your family, Leave your loved ones, leave your comfort zone, and follow me. And of course, Abraham obeyed him. 
And there were many tests that God put Abraham, Abraham through. He said, I, I, I want you to separate from Lot. Separate from him, your family again. But the greatest test of all, I believe, was when God said to Abraham, I want you to take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom thou lovest. And God, he saw this incredible bond and incredible affection that Abraham had for his son. Now, you have to think of it. After all, Abe waited for 100 years. Can you imagine waiting or something for a hundred years? No, because you're not a hundred years old. <laughs> but Abe waited for a hundred years. You know what it's like to wait a long time, a hundred years for this child. It's a long time to wait. And so there's a special bond because this child is a special child. It's the child of promise. And every promise that God gave to Abraham is wrapped up inside of this child. Embodied in that child, in Isaac, was all the promises of God. And God said to Abraham, I want you to offer him up as a sacrifice. I want you to offer up everything I promised to you as a sacrifice. Every gift I said I'd give to you. Every good thing that i do for you. All that you want for me, I want you to offer it up as a sacrifice. Does thou love me more than you love the things that I give you? I think God was saying to Abraham, I really need to know that your love for me surpasses the love that you have for that boy. Because I've watched you, Abe. I've watched you. I've watched you play together. I see that look in your eye. I see he's the apple of your eye, Abe. He's all of your dreams. Everything is wrapped up inside of that boy. But thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all of thy heart, thy strength, thy mind, and thy soul, with all that is within you. Thou shalt love the Lord your God. Your love for me, Abe, has to surpass your love for Isaac. And I'm going to test you to see if that's true. Take him and offer him up. And the Bible says that Abe rose early in the morning. You see, that's quite a statement that he got up early in the morning. Uh, if it was about Jerome, it would have said that he slept in that morning. And uh, around 2 o'clock he got up. He uh, forgot to set his alarm clock, you know. Hey, but Abe, uh, it, it says he, he rose early in the morning. And he split the wood. And he gathered And they went on a three-day journey to Mount Moriah. And Abe told his servants, he says, stay here with the donkey. I and the lad will go yonder and we will worship. That's the first time worship's ever mentioned in the Bible. There was no music playing. There's no choir, there's no band. So what is worship? It's that radical obedience to God. It's responding to the voice of God regardless of the cost, regardless of the consequences. When things don't make sense to your natural mind, God, whatever you require of me, I'll do. No questions. The clay does, never, does not say to the potter why. There's no argument. There's no resistance. Just again, radical obedience. And Abraham takes his knife, and he's ready to plunge it into the child. And God says, stop. Now I know that you love me, or the other translation, that you fear me, that you reverence me, that you respect me. You respect me more, you honor me more than you do your own son because you have not withheld your son, your only son. He doesn't say this time, whom thou lovest. This time, he just says,
your only son. He didn't add any more to it. Because Abraham had proved his love for God surpassed the love for his boy. You see, real worship is not withholding. Worship is so much greater than praise. And I don't want to in any way belittle praise, but it takes us to a much deeper realm, a much higher realm. You know, you have been like Job. The Bible begins to brag about him. It says he's upright and he fears God. He shuns evil and suddenly calamity hits. It strikes Job. And because one day God said, Job. And the devil says, I know about Job. You blessed him and prospered him. The only reason he goes to church, the only reason he tithes, the only reason he praises, the only reason he dances and so on is because you've made him a multimillionaire. You put him into bankruptcy and you'll hear a different story. You'll hear him moan. You'll hear him groan like anybody else. And God says, you got a deal, buddy. Do whatever you want. Just spare his life. Job has to stand at the gravesite of his entire family. Save his wife. It was the death, you know, you, you think about it for a second. The death of one child is incredible. But here is seven sons and three daughters in the grave. All part of one family. And then he turns around and his home and everything else is devastated. He wakes up in the morning and he's covered with boils. And the only thing he can do is cover himself with ashes. It's kind of like a talcum powder. And, and, and his wife, you can't blame Job's wife. Many times we criticize Job's wife. But don't be so hard on Mrs. Job. After all, if you had lost your entire family, and you, you had, uh, you know, you might have a few complaints if you lost everything. But she says, Job, why don't you just get it over with? Curse God and die. But what does Job do? He falls on his face and worships. There's no music. There's no choir. God, I don't understand, but I'm not here to question. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? As for God, his way is perfect. Lord, one day I'll know even as I'm known. Now I see through a glass darkly, one day face to face. But Lord, I do know this, that you're sovereign. Lord, I do know this, that you're a judge and you do everything perfectly. You never had to apologize. And Lord, I can bow down and full assurance yes it's hurtful yes it pains me to see my children lying there but lord i know this that i love you you see worship takes us to another realm we can wind down the story of david after he sins after he sins with Bathsheba. Nine months later, a child is born into the world, and the child lives a few weeks or months, and then God judges David, and the child is stricken with a fever. And David, like any father, goes into the presence of God and begins to pray and wait on the Lord. And so he's fasting and praying before God, and he's trying to intercede on behalf of that child. And seven days go by, and there's a knock on the door, and a servant informs David the child is dead. And what does David do? No arguing, no accusing, no temper flare-ups, no temper tantrums. He cleans up and he goes into the presence of God and he falls down on his face and he worships. There's no music alone. He is bowing in surrender and there's worship. God, your ways are perfect. And so we see the Magi, they brought treasures, gold and frankincense and myrrh. We've seen his star in the east and we've come to worship him. And when they enter the house, his presence, the Bible says they opened their treasures. It was talking about lavish giving, lavish giving. No music, no choir. We've simply come to worship. No withholding. 
They opened their treasures and they poured it out, lavish and extravagant giving. That's worship. You see, worship is when we open up the storehouse and we pour it out before him. We open up our lives and we pour them out before him. Take me, Lord. Take me as I am and do with me as you please. Send me where you want. Use me how you want to use me. Make me say what you want me to say. Make me act like you want me to act. Help me to think like you want me to think. It's lavish giving. Lord, not my stuff, but my life. I'm not asking you to take my sin. I'm giving you my life. Cleanse my sin so you got a clean vessel to live in. It's worship. It's not withholding. And I don't think we know much about it. I simply don't. But I do know this. It's impossible to be a worshiper unless he's on the throne. It's impossible. One cancels out the other. You can't worship him and say, Lord, I worship you, and yet at the same time sit and make your own plan. You see, worship means to kiss the hand of. It's like a dog licking the hand of his owner. Licks his master's hand. It's the appearance of bowing down, of stooping. It's a sign of taking a lower position. It's symbolic of esteeming that person to a greater degree than you are. I bow down, acknowledging the supremacy and the authority and the dignity and the worth of the king. Worship. In worship, it's our purpose. Worship, it's our calling. Worship is our mission. And it's all wrapped up in worship. Amen. The word that I have for you today is about the dwelling place of God. When you come to his house, you'll know his house. It's a radical difference. And you and I are the house of God. It's the place that he desires to dwell. But he's a king, and he wants a place that's fit for a king. And the king will make the decisions as to how he wants to arrange it and what furniture he wants it where. And it should be exactly as the king of kings says. And so today, I want to ask you, if it hasn't been a life of complete worship, then today you come and you get help from the king. Because apart from him, you and I can't worship. But he gives us the ability to worship, but the choice to not or two is ours. And so I call you today that there's a call that's resounding from heaven that calls you today come unto me. And I stand there today. I'm knocking at the door and I'm calling you back to your first love. For those of you who have one day had me and accepted me that today I want to walk with you I want you to experience the peace to experience the joy to hear my voice to let me lead you to let me guide you I'll be your comforter I'm your healer I'm your deliverer I'm your success and so just as when Adam and Eve, who had a perfect relationship, messed up. And they slipped away. They were hiding. They were hiding in the places behind the leaves and all of the things. And sometimes we can hide in the blue chairs. We can keep the music going. We can hide behind the smile, behind the faces, behind all of the things and the facades that we put on. Adam and Eve 
they covered themselves and many times we cover ourselves yes they did it with fig leaves but we do it with all sorts of things i'm blessed and highly favored praise the lord brother hey hallelujah glory to god yes but inside is another story and nothing is hidden from the eyes of the king and so he sees and he is calling you he's calling your name come unto me adam where are you oh it's not that he doesn't know where you're at he wants you to recognize where you've gone to and to acknowledge it adam didn't come looking for him he came looking for adam and he's coming looking for you you don't have to search for him anymore he's come to you and he's calling your name so if you don't know him as lord or savior i invite you right now to come the altar is open and I want to pray with you if you want to accept him as Lord and your Savior and you want Jesus, you want to be in a family of God. And if your life is in, in total, absolute surrender, and I want to invite you to come. I want to pray with you. And I want you to experience the anointing of the Holy Spirit two or three of us come together in prayer and in agreement and watch what God does.